Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of wisdom, the book of Proverbs. How many of you think we need more wisdom? Does anybody believe that? Sure we do. Wisdom is applied knowledge. Say that with me. Wisdom is applied knowledge. Wisdom is not the same as knowledge. Wisdom is higher than knowledge. Knowledge is you know something to be a fact. Wisdom is you apply that. I know that I shouldn't take this step because I have an artificial hip. So if I do this, I may be in severe pain. That's knowledge. The wisdom is don't take the step. I'm not going to do it, all right? I'm going to apply that. If I step off, I might get hurt. And that's knowledge. But I still might go ahead and do it. But the wisdom is don't do it. And God wants to give us wisdom. And we're looking at the book of Proverbs. And obviously, we cannot preach through the entire book of Proverbs. If I started, uh, none of us would be alive when we finished. I'm telling you, this is a long book, and it's got so many wonderful uh, passages in it. But I just want to take a few over the next few weeks and look at them. I've never preached out of the book of Proverbs as far as a series through it, and I wanted to look at that. Now, today we're talking about a very serious subject, and that is the discipline of the Lord. Now, I want you to know that is a guy in that picture. He's got a bad haircut, but that's a guy right there, all right? And he's talking to his child, and as normal, the child is looking away, right? Isn't that what we do? But he got down on his level, which is the way God does with us, and God talks to us and lovingly disciplines us. And we're going to talk about that today. Let me just say this to you. Everybody look this way. If you are a child of God, God wants you in the will of God. Let's just look at three concentric circles just for a moment. First of all, there's the will of God. That is where God wants you to be. God has a will, a will for your life. The Bible says in Romans 12, verse 2, it is good, acceptable, and perfect. Say that with me. Good, acceptable, and perfect. God has a perfect plan for your life. But sin can interrupt that plan. Sin can interrupt the will of God. Sin is not the will of God for you. Some people say everything that happens is the will of God. I beg to differ. Sin is not the will of God. God does not predestine what He prohibits in Scripture. God is not against God. So don't blame your sin on God. You accept the responsibility. And so when you, when you sin, you leave the will of God, and guess where you go? You go to that second level, the woodshed of God. A lot of people don't even know what I'm talking about. But how many of you know what a woodshed is, all right? It's a place where you go to get a spanking. You say, no, it's where you go get wood. Yeah, for a spanking. <laughs> go get some wood, not for the fire, but to light another kind of fire, all right? And so you go out, you get a little piece of wood, and you bring back the smallest piece of wood you can, and they send you back out and say, get a real piece of wood, all right? And the woodshed is where you get disciplined. Now, let me ask you this. When your parents disciplined you, was it because they didn't love you or because they did love you? Which is, which is the case? They did love you. If they didn't care, they just let you do whatever you want to do and just let you be running free out there and running wild. They don't love you enough to even discipline you. But God loves you too much. And look at me. If you sin and you don't immediately repent, I'm not saying you might. I'm telling you, you will. I don't care who you are, you will go to the woodshed of God. And He will spank you because He loves you. But let me tell you the tragedy beyond that. When you're in the woodshed, you can either go back to the will of God or you can continue on in your sin. And God is a patient God, but there comes a time now, you listen to what I'm about to say. There comes a time, and only God knows where that line is, that if you keep on crossing that line, if you keep on living in your sin, you keep on rebelling against God. I'm not just saying this is all in the Scripture too, all right? If you will not respond to the woodshed, 
and you keep on sinning, you will go to a third level called the wrath of God. And look at me, you don't want to be there. That's when God really comes down with the hammer, all right? So, will of God, woodshed of God, wrath of God. I want to be in the will of God. And when God disciplines me when I go to the woodshed, I'm not going to just keep on stubborn in my sin. I'm going back to the will of God. Amen? I don't want his wrath. I read about that in the Bible. I don't want his wrath on me and my family. I want the will of God, which is good, acceptable, and perfect, Romans 12, 2. Now, let's look at Proverbs 3, 11, and 12. My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves, even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. Notice, first of all, that the discipline of the Lord is real. It is real. My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves, even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. King Solomon was writing these words, speaking to the people of Israel, explaining the reality of the discipline of the Lord. He said, don't reject it. It's real. The discipline of the Lord is real. Don't loathe it. Don't hate it. Don't abhor it. Don't disdain it. Don't despise it. Don't be angry when the Lord reproves you, when he rebukes you, when he cautions you, when he warns you, when he admonishes you, when he reprimands you because of your sin. Don't get mad at God. The Lord Solomon was saying to them, has been a good father to Israel. Because of my father David, we have peace all around. All of the other nations bow down to us. We have plenty to eat. We have money in the bank. We have a roof over our head, clothes on our back, and peace in our land. God has blessed us, Solomon was saying to his fellow Israelites, beyond imagination. He has every right, if we sin, to discipline us, even as an earthly father has the right to discipline an obedient, disobedient child. Solomon said it plainly, the discipline of the Lord is real. You know, Solomon knew about the discipline of the Lord because of how God had treated his own mother and father. You see, his mother had been married before, and she had uh, been married to a man named Uriah the Hittite. He was one of David's best warriors. But the Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 11, a familiar story to most people who've been around Christianity, you, you may know that David was not where he was supposed to be. The army had gone out to fight, but he stayed back in the spring of the year. And he went over by the window. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Look at me. When you're in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people, you're going to do the wrong thing. He wasn't with the army. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. And so now he's looking where he shouldn't have been looking. He would have never seen this on the battlefield. But in that day, people... Women and men would go out and they would bathe on the rooftop because nobody could see you on the rooftop except from one place, the king's palace. And the king, we don't have to worry about the king. The king's safe, right? But the king looked out and he saw Bathsheba. And the Bible says in 2 Kings 11 that she was beautiful. Uh, 2 Samuel 11, rather. And uh, he called for her. She came. They slept together. She conceived. And David tried to cover his sin up. Rather than confess, he tried to cover it up. And David brought Uriah off the battlefield, 
had him over to eat, got him drunk, sent him to his wife, knowing, thinking that he would sleep with her and she would, they would think that the baby was theirs instead of David's. But Uriah was such an honorable man, he said, I can't sleep with my wife and enjoy my wife's company while my soldiers under me are out in battle. He was a very honorable man. So he didn't sleep with his wife. And David did it again. He still didn't do it. So David put a note in his hand to give to the commander of the army when he got back, Joab. He said, you give this to the commander. He was carrying his own death notice in his hand. It said, put Uriah in the front of the battle where the fiercest war is going on so that he'll be killed. And he had to be an honorable man. He didn't even read the note. He handed that to Joab. He went too close. He got killed. And David thought he has covered his sin. But God, God had another plan. God didn't like what happened. God sent to him a prophet named Nathan. Nathan came and said, uh, King, I'm going to tell you a story, something that's happened in your kingdom. There was a man that was very rich. There was another man that had only one little lamb. And this rich man had somebody come in town, and rather than killing one of his many sheep or or cattle for a meal, he went and took the little lamb of the man, the only one he owned, and he slaughtered that so that his guests could have something to eat. David got furious. He said, that man deserves to die. And Nathan pointed his finger right in the king's face and said, you're the man. You had everything. You had wives. You have all these blessings. You had all this power. Uriah had one little lamb, and you took her, and you had a child with her, and God is going to pour out his discipline on you, and he is going to make your family suffer. You're going to lose your throne temporarily. One of your children will rebel. He went on and on and on and on, and when, he, when, he, when David realized what was happening, he hit the deck. He repented. Nathan said, your sins are forgiven, but God is still going to spank you. That, he didn't say that. He said, God's going to discipline you. That child is going to die. And the little child that had been conceived between David and Bathsheba died. Now, why do I tell you that story? It does, look at me. It doesn't matter who you are or where you are positioned. If you're a child of God, and you sin, God is going to discipline you. The quicker you repent, the better. Repent means not only to admit it, but to quit it. <laughs> Don't just admit it. Stop doing it. Quit it. Cut it out. And ask God to forgive you and humbly repent. The Bible says that God spoke to the people of Israel under Moses' leadership. When they were wandering in the wilderness, the Bible says, out of the heavens, He let you hear the voice, His voice to discipline you. And on earth, He let you see His great fire, and you heard His words from the midst of the fire. I'll say it for about the third time. If you're a Christian and you sin, God loves you too much to leave you alone. He will discipline. It's not a matter of if He will. It's a matter of when and how He will. Repent as quickly as you can. Sometimes God will reprove you with time out. But sometimes God will give you a spanking. You'll feel like it's lights out. Can anybody in this room, I'm going to raise my hand if you're the least bit concerned. Can anybody in this room attest to the fact that God will discipline you if you're a Christian and you sin? Anybody believe that? Look all around. Doesn't matter who you are, God is no respecter of persons. God disciplined Moses 
He told him to speak to the rock the second time, but he hid it to make it look like he drew the water out of it, and God disciplined Moses. God disciplined Moses' sister, Miriam. She said, we're just as holy as you are, and God speaks through us just like he speaks through you, Moses. God disciplined her with a week-long case of leprosy. God disciplined King Saul when he sacrificed, and it was only Samuel, the judge, that was supposed to sacrifice. God disciplined Saul. And God disciplined Peter when he denied Jesus three times. He confronted him three times and disciplined him. Listen to me. It doesn't matter if you're Moses or King David or Apostle Paul or Peter. It doesn't matter who you are. You sin, you'd better get to repenting real quick because discipline, the Lord's discipline is a reality. Secondly, the Lord's discipline should be received. You say, Brother Steve, I don't like that part. I, I just don't want to receive the Lord's discipline. Oh, it's a good thing. Look at verse 11. My son, don't reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof. It's a good thing. Can't you remember your parents saying that when they spanked you? This is going to be a good thing. It's not feeling real good right now. I didn't say it would feel good. This is not good for right now maybe, but it's good down the road. And really it's good for right now, even though it may not feel good. Don't reject it. Solomon said, don't reject it. Receive his discipline. Don't loathe his reproof. It is a protective mechanism. It is a spiritual safeguard. It will help you in the future do the right thing and not to make the same mistake. God was saying, I will reward you when you obey my commandments, but I will discipline you. I will spank you, if you will, when you disobey my commands. Both rewarding and discipline were vital for the Israelites to cause them to stay in line with the commands and the statutes of Almighty God. And even though it was painful, the discipline of the Lord toward His erring children was a blessing, not a blight. They were to receive it, not reject it. When Don and I started having children, we decided we would discipline them when they needed it, and sometimes that would include spanking our children. We never spanked them for just making mistakes, spilling milk, you don't get a spanking for that. Accidentally breaking something, I might want to, but you're not going to get a spanking for that. But if we tell you to do something, Grant, Lindsay, Allison, Bethany, and you look at us and you say, no, game over. <laughs> Go to your room. Go to our room. We'd shut the door and we'd spank them. You say, you're terrible. Look at me. Every one of them has children. Trust me, they've got children. They've got a lot of children and more on the way. Three on deck. Three boys coming up, March, April, May. That's not their names. That's when they'll be, that's when they'll be born. But every one of our children says, thank you. They didn't say it at the time, but I wasn't doing it just for the time. And by the way, I'm the one that took care of that. I didn't put that on my wife. And I'm not trying to brag that we did everything right. Donna did everything right. I'm sure I made a lot of mistakes. I don't think she did, but I, I'm sure I did. But some of you may not realize that what I was doing is in the Bible. It says in Proverbs 13, 24, those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. I've had parents tell me, I love my children too much to spank them. Look at me. The Bible says if you don't do it, you hate them. I just read to you a scripture. 
Those who love their children care enough to discipline them. Proverbs 23, 15, a youngster's heart is filled with foolishness. What is that? Sinful nature. We all have it, don't we? Now you can say yes, it's okay. Don't you have a sinful nature? Even my grandbabies have a sinful nature. And so do yours. All of our children have that natural bent toward selfishness. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. A youngster's heart is filled with foolishness, but physical discipline will drive it far away. And I love Proverbs 23, 13. Don't fail to discipline your children. They won't die if you spank them. The Lord's discipline should be received. The Bible says in Job 5, verses 17 and 18, Behold, how happy is the man whom God reproves. Do not despise the discipline of the Almighty, for he inflicts pain, but he also gives relief. He wounds, but his hand also heals. A.W. Tozer once said, It's doubtful whether God can bless any man greatly until he has wounded him deeply. When you despise the discipline of the Lord, you're actually hating yourself. Proverbs 15, 32 says, he who neglects discipline despises himself. But he who listens to reproof acquires understanding. Look at me. You don't know everything. God does. When God tells you don't, Dr. Rogers said, when God tells you don't do this, he's saying don't hurt yourself. When God says do this, he's saying help yourself. Dr. Rogers was right. God knows what he's doing. My son, don't reject the discipline of the Lord. Don't loathe his reproofs. You should receive the discipline of the Lord. Well, the Lord's discipline is real and it should be received, but there's one more thing I want to show you very quickly, the Lord's discipline has reasons. There's a reason for all of this. Look at verse 11. <clears throat> My son, don't reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof. Whom the Lord loves, he reproves, even as a father that corrects the son in whom he delights. Everything God does, he does for a reason. God is intentional. God has a purpose. God knows the future and the past and the present. God knows the plans that he has for you, plans for welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. God's will for you is good, acceptable, and perfect. And he is doing, he is taking everything and conforming you to the image of his son, and he's taking everything and making it work for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. So God, his discipline has a good purpose. Let me give you three of them. I think these are the most important. First of all, God's discipline confirms His love. It confirms His love. Go back to our verse that I've read about five times now. My son, don't reject the discipline of the Lord. Don't loathe His reproof. Whom the Lord loves, He reproves. Even as the Father corrects the Son in whom He delights. Now look at me. There were times that I would spank my children. I didn't beat them. I didn't abuse them, but I did spank them. But look at me. Don't you dare try to spank my children. They're not your children. They're my children. I'm not going to spank your children. I'm sure not going to spank my grandbabies. Amen? <laughs> For several reasons. All right. In fact, my kids <laughs> will say, what has happened to you? Who are you? I said, well, if y'all have been this good, you know, that's all I can say. If y'all have been this good, you know, I, I can't help it. <laughs> Couldn't be anything with me, you know. But you see, when God disciplines you, He's showing you that He loves you. If He didn't do it, he, it would show He didn't care. If He didn't discipline, He'd just say, you just go on and ruin your life. You go on and keep on sinning. If God 
didn't love you, he wouldn't correct you. He wouldn't discipline you. He wouldn't even take the time. But he loves you too much to let you self-destruct in your sin. Aren't you glad for that? Aren't you glad that you've got somebody watching over you? It's never, his discipline is never rooted in anger. It's always rooted in love. He wants to teach you. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 8, listen to this. Have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. He's quoting the text from which I'm preaching over in Proverbs. Don't give up when he corrects you, for the Lord disciplines those whom he loves. He punishes each one he accepts as a child. As you endure the, this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by its father? Oh, I can tell him several. Amen. I could give him a list on that. Verse 8, if God doesn't discipline you, please listen. As he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and you're not really his children at all. You know what that's saying? It means if you sin and you don't repent and God doesn't discipline you, it doesn't mean God says, okay, you get a freebie there. And he winks at it. No, he doesn't wink at sin. It means you don't belong to him. You're illegitimate. You're not a child of God. I thank God that he keeps me on a short leash. Amen? Beth Moore said, he, he said, I've been walking with him so long, Beth Moore said, he keeps me on a keychain. <laughs> There's an image for you. The moment I sin, you don't have to tell me, the Holy Ghost is shouting in my soul, that was the wrong thing to say, Hoss. That was the wrong thing to do. You don't have to tell me. And with all due respect, Donna doesn't even have to tell me. The Lord tells me. I'm grieved. I grieve His Spirit. How many of you know what I'm talking about? The minute you sin, you know it in your soul. Revelation 3.19 says, those, God says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Whom the Lord loves, He reproves. But then also God's discipline not only confirms his love, but it cleanses our sin. There's a cleansing nature to discipline. My son, don't reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. It's a spiritual cleanser. The Bible goes on to say in Hebrews 12, verses 9 through 11, since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the earth, the father of our spirits, and live forever. For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how. But God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share His holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. Can I get an amen on that? Oh, I'm just enjoying this, Dad. Thank you for whipping me. This is awesome. Thank you, Edgar Gaines. You're an incredible man. Keep on, keep on. That's crazy. I mean, I started screaming when he just undid his belt. You know, I mean, I, I was already feeling it, man. I was just, you know, and when those loops, how many of you know what that loop thing sounded like? Like that? Yeah. He had a big left hand and a big belt. And he told me, he said, when it comes out, it's going on you. I'm not pulling this thing off to be talked down and talked out of it. It's over. When you hear that, it's over. Now I can say, you were abused. You should have reported it. (laughs) No, I, I wasn't abused. I thank God that I had a daddy that wouldn't let me pop off to him. Amen. Wouldn't let me, wouldn't let me steal anything. Wouldn't let me tell a lie wouldn't let me do a lot of things that I shouldn't have done. I thank God for that. I didn't like it at the moment. Hebrews 12, 10, that we might share his holiness. It stops us from sinning. 
God is a God who loves us and disciplines us for good. Verse 11 said, no discipline is enjoyable while it's happening, it's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in His way. How many of you believe that the church could use some folks living right? Amen? You know how it comes? When God disciplines you. He teaches you. He makes you more godly and more holy. It cleanses our sin. God's discipline is rational. It, there's a reason for it. It confirms His love. It cleanses our sin, but it also finally communicates truth. My son, don't reject the discipline of the Lord. Don't loathe his reproof. Whom the Lord loves, he reproves, even as a father, the son in whom he delights. When God disciplines you, he communicates. Look at me. When Edgar spanked me, he communicated. Not with words, but with discipline. And I'd hold on, I will have to tell you this, and I know that my, both of my parents are in heaven. I'm not talking bad about my parents. It was just, how many of you know that people are different? Anybody know you're different? My, my dad would spank me. It'd be over with. Let's go fishing. Let's do whatever. My mom would spank me. She'd go over and start washing dishes, start talking about it, get mad again. She'd come spank me again. Amen. I'm just like, I'm just like you know, once she does it, I'm just going to leave the house. Amen. Because I don't need a repeat on this deal, Okay. Anybody have a mama like that? Anybody out there? Okay, yeah. We called her Hot Dot. Her name was Dorothy. (laughs) Hot Dot, baby. You better get out of the way. (laughs) Oh, I've gotten so tickled. I don't know if I can preach now. All right. (laughs) Bible places a high premium on discipline because of this. Listen to this, Proverbs 12, 1. Learn to learn you must love discipline. It is stupid to hate correction. Proverbs 15, 32. If you reject discipline, you only harm yourself. But if you listen to correction, you grow in understanding. You're going to be smarter. Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. What is the root word of discipline? Disciple. Make disciples. Part of that, God does that. He makes you a disciple by disciplining you when you sin. One last thing. The Apostle Paul got disciplined in a preventive way. The Apostle Paul wrote half the New Testament. The Apostle Paul had visions, was caught up into heaven and went to the third heaven and heard and saw things that he couldn't even talk about. The Apostle Paul was given much, and to much, whom much is given, much is required, all right? And so God did a preventive discipline for him. I'll read it to you from Paul himself. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations I received, To keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger, an angelos of Satan, literally a demon, to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I begged, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with my weaknesses, with insults, distresses, persecutions, difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul was given a gift. We don't know exactly what it was, but it was something that he prayed about. It was so painful. It was so, it it, it touched him, and he begged God three times to take it away. God, take this away. No, 
God, take this away. No. God, take this away. No. Because that is the thing that keeps you from getting the big head, Paul. That's the thing that keeps you usable, Paul. That's the thing that keeps you dependent on me. That's the thing that keeps you praying. Paul, you're a better man with that thorn in your flesh. And I'm not going to take it away from you, but I'll tell you what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you my grace. And you're going to thank me for it. How many of you know that even the thorns in our flesh can be used of God to keep us in his will? It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when and how. God is going to discipline you, but when he does, just look up and say, Heavenly Father, I can't even believe that you would even care enough to discipline me when I do wrong. I know that that means that you love me. And Lord, I'd be lying if I said, oh, I just love this discipline. But I sure do love the one who's doing the discipline. Thank you, God, for the discipline that you give to me. Thank you for the discipline of the Lord. Amen? Let's thank God that he disciplines us, all right?